Hello, fellow foodies. Welcome back to Foodie Pharmacology. This is your host, Dr. Cassandra Quave, and I'm really excited to dive into this episode. Our guest today is Dr. Sarah Berry. She's the first author on a study entitled Human postprandial responses to food and potential for precision nutrition. Now, don't get intimidated by the title. She's going to break down the science and share the latest findings on her research concerning human metabolic responses to food intake. First, let me tell you a bit more about Dr. Barry. She is a reader in nutritional sciences at King's College London. Her research interests relate to the influence of dietary components on cardiometabolic disease risk, with particular focus on postprandial metabolism and precision nutrition. Since commencing her research career at King's College London in 2000, she has been the academic leader for more than 30 human nutrition studies in cardiometabolic health. Sarah is also the lead nutritional scientist on the world's largest ongoing program of the personalized nutrition studies known as the PREDICT studies. And these are assessing the genetic, metabolic, metagenomic, and meal-dependent effects on metabolic responses to food. I'm so excited to have her on the show. Thanks for so much for coming, Sarah. It's great to meet you. And you, thanks so much for having me on here. Great. And you're dialing in from where today? So from London, which uh, where we've experienced our first snow for about two years over the last few days, which for my young kids is beyond exciting. I bet it's beautiful. That's great. Well, let's go ahead and dive in. Um, I want to start with just a basic question. Can you tell us, you know, what is precision nutrition and why do you think it's important? Um, Absolutely. So really simply put, precision nutrition is nutrition tailored to the individual. And I think in order to understand why it's important, we need to kind of take a step back and think of where we are currently in the world of nutritional research, what the challenges are that we have and why do we need to transition as we are beyond looking at the average um, and, you know, into looking at the individual response. And so you know, many people be aware in terms of medical or nutrition research, we typically look at the mean, the average response to whether it's an intervention or or a drug. And population guidelines are also based on the average, Mm -hmm. Um, you know, and that's for a whole host, host of reasons. But we're now at this real kind of crossroads in research that we're really starting to, you know, understand that actually there is no one size fits all approach certainly to nutrition, and that everyone responds differently. And so how I might respond to a food versus how you might respond or anyone in the audience is hugely variable. And so we need to start unraveling what is determining how people respond differently, why they respond differently, and what these differences in, in response are. And we're at a perfect time in nutritional research and the evolution of research tools to be able to do this. So traditionally, uh, nutritional research has really had the um, option of either undertaking very large, but what we call very low precision studies. So epidemiology studies, these very kind of big cross-sectional survey studies. Or we've had the option of undertaking very small, like randomized controlled trial studies, but very high precision. And so in the past, we haven't really had the opportunity to be able to undertake research at scale, breadth and depth, which is what's required for precision nutrition. And we're now at these really exciting times, I think, in research that we can capitalize on novel technologies. So whether it's wearable technologies like Fitbits um, or, um, you know, novel clinical devices such as continuous glucose monitors. Um, We can also capitalize on this really growing interest that people have in finding out about themselves. Everyone wants to know, what can I eat to get healthier? You know, how can I measure this? And we call this citizen science. And so we're at the exciting times that we can collect huge amounts of data using these new technologies, and then we can apply new kind of computational biology, so machine learning or AI. And so we're now able in nutritional research to get this breadth, 
this depth and this precision to actually make you know personalized and precision nutrition a, a reality that's so exciting and yeah the 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 advent of all these different technologies really i could see how they could open up so many doors and you know nutrition is such a complicated area of science you know, what are some of the major influencers of your nutritional status? It goes beyond just the food that you eat, right? Absolutely. And this is what we've been looking at in the predict studies, and we can come on to discuss in more detail. And I I think a way that I often explain to people really to kind of visualize or understand the depth of the complexity is imagine you have a food with more than 2000 chemicals and all of these chemicals interact with each other. Imagine you've got your thou- you've got an individual with thousands of biological pathways, which are all unique to that individual. You know, throw th- those thousands of biological pathways and those thousands of chemicals and the food that are already interacting, throw them together. And this is why you have this like 10 to 50 fold difference in how everyone responds to food because of this complexity. And so By collecting really large amounts of data, what we can do is we can move beyond looking at single determinants or single foods, which is what we need to be doing now in nutritional research. And we can look at these multiple integrated and interrelated uh, pathways. So we can look at a whole host of exposures. So, you know, uh, know, as you just asked, we can look at physiological exposures. We can look at age, we can look at sex, we can look at genetics, microbiome, you know, how we eat as well. So it's not just what we eat, you know, time of day, uh, how much sleep you've had, how much exercise you've done, how stressed you feel. And we can look at all of these factors that play into that person's unique biology in these thousands of pathways I mentioned. And we can look at how all of those different factors impact, therefore, that person's response to a given meal or a given uh, dietary pattern and start to kind of untangle this. And this is what we're doing with our whole predict program. (laughs) So impressive. It is really a tangled web of of so much data. Well, I wanted to ask another question about just even the title of, of, of um, one of your recent studies and, you know, what is postprandial metabolic responses? What, what are those and why are they important when it comes to food? So I'd like to probably start by saying I'm biased. It's what I've studied for the last 20 years of my research. Um, And uh, a lot of my expertise is on postprandial metabolism, but actually it's because it's important, not just because I find it fascinating. So uh, again, traditionally, if we look back to how we've studied the effect of diet on our bodies, we've generally studied it in the fasting state. So we would put someone on an intervention and we'd say, okay, have this for two weeks or two months, et cetera, two years, come back, come to the clinic fasted, we'll do a fasting lipids, glucose, or, you know, whatever we're measuring. But we actually know that what happens in that very short term post consuming a food is really important. And it's those very short term changes that occur that underpin many of the long term effects of diets on our health. And we use the term postprandial to mean post food consumption um, to look at what's happening in that very acute period. And so, if I can give you an example of what happens when we consume a meal, so let's say we consume a mixed meal which would contain fat, protein, and carbohydrate. And what would happen is the carbohydrate. Uh, from that meal would cause this very short, sharp elevation in circulating glucose in the blood. So you've got this very kind of sharp sort of mountain peak where you're, Mm -hmm. you know, peaking at at maybe 30 to 45 minutes and then you're returning to baseline, let's say around two hours. At the same time, the fat that's in the meal causes this more kind of elongated, let's say kind of more like a a nice sort of tumbling hill, um, you know, of, a rise in blood triglycerides, which is basically blood fat. And that reaches a peak around four hours and returns to baseline around eight hours. Now, if you imagine this kind of mountain that I've said and this hill that I've said, and if you were to map that onto each eating event that you have throughout the day, and for many of us, we have on average two to three main meals and two to three snacks. So we have on average about five eating events throughout the day. If you were to map those onto each eating event, 
you could imagine you're looking at this beautiful landscape of mountains and hills yeah and you only get to that flat little desert about four in the morning until about eight in the morning and so really how relevant is it to measure what's going in and on in that kind of four hour period that little flat desert versus what's happening when you've got these tumbling hills and mountains Mm -hmm. And that's kind of my simple way of really trying to visually explain what's happening. And when you've got these peaks and these troughs and in glucose and triglycerides, what happens is, is at the same time, you um, stimulate a whole downstream um, uh, series of events of met. It's like a cascade of metabolic flux. So you have uh, an increase in circulating oxidative stress measures, inflammatory measures, hemostatic, which is around blood clotting measures. You have um, changes in the lipids and the composition of the lipids that are circulating, which can make your um, uh, be proatherogenic. So increase the um, risk of atherosclerosis and cardiovascular disease. And we now know from both mechanistic studies how important it is to measure these postprandial changes because of this metabolic flux that it causes. And we also know from these very large epidemiological studies that actually postprandial glucose and postprandial triglycerides following mixed meals are independent risk factors for you know, various diseases such as cardiovascular disease, type 2 diabetes, and may also uh, increase your risk of going on to, to develop obesity as well. Wow. That's incredible. And I, and your, your idea around focusing on what a more realistic kind of perspective is and the, and the flow of the day, I think is, is really important. Um, it's really more reflective of what people are actually experiencing. Yeah. Yeah. And I think an important thing that to note as well around this is that what, by looking at the postprandial changes, what we're able to do as well is you often see um, differentiation in people's postprandial response long before you see that play out in the fasting state. Hmm. So what we can do is we can capture, um, you know, metabolic disturbances or capture differences in the way people respond to food that may be relevant for health many, many years before it would come out to play in the fasting state. So it kind of, you know, it gets us ahead of the game, so to say. That's great. Well, I'm really curious to learn more about the PREDICT studies. Um, this is a massive undertaking. Um, how large is this study and how long has it been going on for? So the PREDICT studies are, is actually a program of research. Mm-hmm. Um, it started uh, with the PREDICT-1 study, which was uh, took place between 2018 and 2019. This was a thousand people study, and it was a very intense postprandial study and with the sole purpose of really trying to uh, push the boundaries in terms of you know, understanding uh, people's responses to food and using data science to really be able to guide people how to eat for their unique biology. And so uh, it was out of this was born the PREDICT-1 study. And the PREDICT-1 study uh, was undertaken uh, over about a one year period. I've run RCTs of uh, 20 people studies that typically take me about a year. But hats off to them, we did it. Uh, wow. It was a great team. But, um, since then, we've completed the PREDICT 2 study with another 1,000 people. And uh, towards the end of last year, we launched the PREDICT 3 study. Um, the basic principle of all of these studies is really combining these novel technologies, this AI and you know, scientific and nutritional expertise to unravel what is causing the differences in how we respond to food and you know what is their relative uh, uh, impact. Tell us a bit more about what is it like to set up a randomized clinical trial? Um, do you stratify across age groups or in, in sex or how, how do you recruit um, these thousand people? <laughs> um, so the, the way that we undertook this study was a little bit different to the typical smaller studies that I've been running for the last 20 years at King's College uh, London. Um, 
we were very fortunate that we were able to capitalise on the Twins UK cohorts. And this is a cohort that was set up by Professor Spector uh, some years ago. And he has about 14,000 twins, and these are identical and non-identical twins. And this is part of a whole a longitudinal study that they're followed up at sequential time points, you know, over an, a number of years. And so the majority of the people were recruited through the Twins UK cohort. Um, we also recruited other people using our typical routes of social media and, mm -hmm. uh, and et cetera. Um, and what we wanted to do is we wanted to be able to make the results as applicable to the general population as possible. So we kept our inclusion and exclusion criteria uh, quite minimal uh, in terms of solid exclusion. We included as many people as possible as long as they didn't have any overt clinical disease. So that meant that we could then go on once we had collected the data to stratify the data after collection. So rather than stratifying prior to okay. uh, recruiting the individuals, it meant that we had enough from you know, each age group, each sex, um, you know, a, a, and all the different kind of criteria that we were looking at and different phenotypes that we were interested in already. That's great. So what, what kind of things did you uh, monitor during the study? Were you tracking their diets? Um, were they tracking exercise in addition to food intake? So um, it was a, a sequential test meal challenge study. Mm -hmm. And uh, we monitored a whole host of uh, multiomics, genetics, mm -hmm. um, uh, factors, microbiome. And I can explain a little bit the actual methods of what people had to do and tell you what we collected whilst. Uh, That'd be I'm great. That. Yeah. So we would have individuals come to our clinical research facility. They would uh, arrive fasted and we would ask them to fill out a whole host of questionnaires. So firstly, we wanted to capture lots of data on their background diet, their background health, et cetera. Um, uh, we then undertook a whole series of measurements such as anthropometry. So looking at their you know, height, weight, we would uh, undertook DEXA scans to look at their visceral fat um, and you know, basic kind of physiological measurements that we would typically do in any nutrition study. So blood lipids, urine, um, blood pressure. And uh, we also collected a stool sample to make a metagenomic uh, analysis for their microbiome mm -hmm. and participants then consumed a test meal consisting of one of our lovely test muffins which contained um, 50 grams of fat 85 grams of carbohydrates so it was quite a high fat high carb meal so that we could really kind of push the system so that we could really cause this big mountain and this big hill to measure and then we collected numerous blood samples throughout the day. At four hours, we gave them another test meal, continued collecting blood samples. And then at the end of the day, they were free to leave our unit and they started a two week at home phase. And this is where we really capitalized on these technologies. So we fitted them with a continuous glucose monitor. They had an activity monitor. They downloaded the Zoe app onto their phone. And using this, they weighed and recorded everything that they ate using a kind of special dashboard that was monitored in real time by a team of nutritionists. Um, and wow. we used new technology, the barcoding, the pictures uh, and weights. And we also worked with a company to develop a new dry blood spot method of uh, that could be done remotely and enable us to measure their blood triglycerides and also their C-peptide as well, which we use as a surrogate measure of insulin secretion. Mm. So they did all of this remotely and we captured information on the app on not just the food they were eating, but on hunger and satiety, um, alertness. And then at the end of the two weeks, they also provided us with another stool sample. And so from all of this, what we were able to do is capture very detailed and very high precision data on what foods they were eating. And this is, you know, the, the, the foundation of all nutritional research. If we can't capture good data about what someone's eating, then we don't have a foundation from which to study from. 
We also analyze, like I said, the stool samples for the microbiome. We analyze the blood for, for metabolomics, for all the basics as well, glucose, insulin, triglycerides, mm. a whole host of biochemical measures. Um, and then we um, also analyzed for, for genetics. And remember, we had this unique twins cohort as well, which That's enabled right. us to look, look at that in, in a lot of depth. So that's kind of a, a bit of a quick oversight of uh, w- w- what I've wanted to so do. This is, so you have a, a massive amount of data, of, of many different forms of data from genetic information, from the microbiome, from, you know, the metabolomic data. So um, where do you go from there? How did, how, did, how did you go about assessing these large data sets and what were some of the key findings? So this is where the Zoe data science team became invaluable. <laughs> um, many nutritionists, sadly, aren't particularly well trained in statistics uh, like myself. And so they used, you know, what, what I kind of think of as this, this, this black box, because it's beyond my comprehension how they do all of this amazing uh, data analysis. But they used uh, techniques such as machine learning, so that they could build prediction models to start to be able to see if we could predict from our various exposures a a given um, output. And I think the first thing that we found that I think, you know, we all knew about, like I said at the beginning, about this huge individual variability, but no one had really looked at it in a systematic way as we have done with the PREDICT trial. And so the first thing that we found was just how huge this variability was. So how hugely different everyone's postprandial response mm. was. And remember, these were broadly healthy people. These were broadly similar people. They were all attended our metabolic unit under tightly controlled conditions. So they'd all fasted. They were all sitting there. They hadn't had, ex- you know, weren't exercising, you know, et cetera. And so despite t- quite tightly controlling them on the clinic day, we saw more than a tenfold difference in, you know, the size of these mountains or these hills between people wow. in their glucose and tag. You know, it was quite enormous. And, you know, what's interesting is when we plotted at the line of every individual's either glucose or triglycerides or insulin response, and then we plotted the mean response, as what, which is how we would typically show the data, you could see it really brought home just how meaningless the mean was for you mm. know, the majority of the individuals, how few actually sat where that mean line was. And I think that was really interesting. The other thing that we were able to do in this study, which is really important for precision nutrition, and I think is often overlooked, is for precision nutrition or any kind of precision medicine to be of value, we need to be able to show that the within subject kind of day-to-day variability within an individual is less than the between subject variability. And so if the variability that I have in response from one day to another is more than the variability or the difference between you and I, for example, Mm -hmm. then that makes precision nutrition very difficult. Yeah. And so when our volunteers were on that two week at home phase, what each morning they were given different test muffins to have. So um, they were asked again to fast overnight and each morning they would have either a high carb or a high fat or high protein or high fiber muffin. So these were standardized, tightly controlled meals and they were given in duplicate. So for example, if they were asked to have, you know, the high fiber meal, they would have that in, in, you know, as a duplicate. So on two separate occasions. And so that meant it allowed us to look at this within individual, which we call the intra-individual variability. And so we were able to see how much variability is there between us, so between you and I, and how much Mm -hmm. variability is there for you day to day. And what we could see quite clearly was that the within intra-individual variability was actually a lot lower than the between uh, person variability which, you know, is a great starting point because therefore, great, we know that this is something, a venture worth following. Yeah, that you can, you can then track and that's, that's so important. And I guess it's what you would expect that different individuals would have different genetic backgrounds, different microbiome composition. Um, Yeah. 
Well, but at the same time, the foods that we eat so, you know, so influence our, our micro microbiome composition as well. And I, I know that science is still emerging on just how much our microbiomes influence um, based on different meals, because we're not just feeling, feeding our bodies. We're also feeding all the microbes that live in our body. What can you tell us about the um, microbiome results from this study? What we were able to do with the PREDICT study was we were able to look at all of the different exposures to all of the different kind of determinants that are determining our response to food, where microbiome was one of these. And what we were able to do is actually look at the relative importance of these. And this all formed part of our prediction model. So we were able to, for each outcome, so for example, for glucose, we we're able to look at how important is um you know, how we eat, so sleep or time of day versus the microbiome or versus mm. your genetics, etc. And we were able to do this again for triglycerides and for insulin. So we we're able to look at all the pieces of the puzzle, but also the sizes of the pieces of the puzzle. And so what was really interesting is we found that actually the microbiome was really important in determining your blood triglyceride response, which has never been looked at before. Oh, wow. We found that it was important in determining your blood glucose response, not quite as big a piece of the puzzle as with um, your triglycerides, but still, you know, a, a large enough piece of the puzzle. Now, that's some, there had been some work on that before, but no one had ever looked at the microbiome in, in relation to uh, uh, blood triglycerides response. And so we could look for each outcome, what's the kind of most important factor determining that. And this, I think, is really important because we could tell people, yes, the microbiome is important. Genetics didn't play that big a role. And we were able to really unravel that because we had identical and non-identical twins. How we eat was very important and what we fitted in with this. But one piece um, of the puzzle. So when you say that the ways that we eat influence these outcomes. What do you mean by that? Are we talking about time, how long it takes us to consume a meal? So I mean by that how we eat. So the meal context, we often refer to it as, and there's lots of factors that feed into how we eat. So this includes when and how we've exercised, um, how much sleep we've had, how our, our stress levels might be, the time of day that we eat and like you say you know over what time period we're starting to explore this in a lot more detail now and we're finding for example the time of day is really important now you know we had known this from some small studies before but we're able to look at you know for whom is this important so again we see huge variability in in some people for example in younger people, the time of day seems to be really important. Hmm. But in older individuals, the time of day seems to be less important. So if we were to take postprandial glucose as an example, a younger individual will have a lot uh, greater postprandial glucose response in the afternoon compared to the morning. So the younger individual, we might say, do you know what? If you want to carb have a load of carbs, why don't you have them for breakfast? And yet for older individuals, we see that actually their difference in terms of their glycemic response from breakfast to lunch is not that much different. Mm. And so we can start to now unravel. And obviously, you know, that's still quite simplified. That's just kind of a stratified way of looking at it based on age. And once we bring in all the other factors that we've measured, we can really look at an individual level. You know, when are you better to eat your carbs or your fat versus someone else? Yeah. And I think that's, that's the big question. Um, I think that's what most excites me about the possibilities of precision nutrition is, you know, do you envision that a day will come when we'll be able to do, use this science on an individual level at the palm of our hand, maybe with an app measuring or weighing our foods and, and determining what is the best diet? This is, this is a question I get all the time is how do you know what the best diet is for each individual? And as far as I understand it, there is no magic answer for all individuals, but it is very, um, it's part of the precision, the precision, uh, you know, puzzle of how you find that out. 
Certainly. And I think, you know, we're still a way off from offering truly individualized advice at a population level. And I think that the more that we learn and the more that we can understand what are the determinants and what, um, you know, how different people respond, ultimately in years to come, I'm hoping it's something that would be available for all, that we could implement this at a population level. So we could say quite simply, you know, that you based on your age, your sex, you know, some other key variables that we might un- uh, discover to be particularly important that this is a kind of individualized plan for you. That's great. And would you hypothesize that these, these parameters would vary um, quite a bit if you have, if you've already developed a certain type of chronic disease, let's say if you're diabetic or if you have cardiovascular disease, um, do you think these parameters will differ for those individuals versus a young, healthy individual? I think so. I think that, you know, a point I made earlier is that the differences we see in postprandial responses in healthy individuals kind of give us a first hint of what's going on prior to any long term health effect. So I think that a lot of the underpinning principles would be quite similar. But I think the way that we would approach them from a, a nutrition and food perspective might be slightly, slightly different. And this is something that you know, we need to explore as well. That's great. So what is next? What's up on the horizon for the PREDICT study? So we have a lot of (laughs) exciting things uh, to follow. So um, as I mentioned earlier, we're kind of crunching the numbers on our PREDICT 2 study, and we're now well into our our PREDICT 3 study. And we've just got this goldmine of data that there is so many exciting possibilities of um, you know, exploring this and really unraveling more and more about what determines our response to food. And I think that we've scratched the surface uh, of this so far. And, you know, as, as each new um, data analysis is unraveled and we find new answers to questions, it throws up whole new questions that we can then go on to explore. And so, uh, you know, it, it's just working with this gold mine of data and continuing to work with the amazing citizen science that, that, you know, contribute to all of this for us. So what can you tell us about the major findings on the microbiome from these studies? So in our study, for the first time ever, we were able to look at the relationship between the microbiome and diet and the microbiome and health outcomes. And what we identified is what we're calling a microbiome signature. So we identified a cluster uh, or signature of uh, gut microbes that were associated with a healthy diet and the same cluster that were associated with favorable health outcomes. Hmm. And then we identified another cluster, another signature of microbes that were associated with an unhealthy diet that were also associated with unhealthy or unfavorable health outcomes. So from this, we've generated this microbiome signal of 15, what we call 15 good and 15 bad microbes. And that, you know, cross uh, over from diet to health. And I think this is really uh, quite special that we see this diet microbiome health link in our study. Absolutely. And within these, um, I guess, is there a magic formula of, of the ratio of, of these different microbes, or is that still something that, that needs to be further explored? Yeah, so this is something we're exploring, and it's hugely variable. So everyone's makeup of different uh, micro, you know, their microbiome is, is hugely different. And we're able to actually look at how comparable different people's microbiome was in our study, because as I mentioned earlier, we had a majority of twins in our study. And what we found was that there was about 34% of shared microbiome between identical twins, and yet there was 30% between non-related individuals. So genetics was only making about 4% contribution it appears to the makeup of the microbiome. And this is really exciting, I think, as a nutritionist, because it shows just how uh, possible it is 
for us to actually modify our microbiome. And we know, again, from our study, this strong relationship we see between diet, between foods and dietary patterns and the microbiome really raises, you know, quite an exciting possibility that we can therefore manipulate the diet to manipulate these bugs, and particularly these good and bad bugs, so the signature, to ultimately impact these health outcomes. That's so powerful. I mean, that that really empowers people to to improve upon their health. It's not just about calories. It's about the types of calories that we're taking in and the sources of food. Um, have you done any work looking at um, specific groups of vegetables or is it is it more on the basic level of actually, you know, divided down to ratios of carbohydrates to proteins to fats, or are there certain vegetable groups that tend to be associated with more of these good bacteria? Yeah, so uh, with the data that we collected, we were able to look across what I often call kind of different tiers in nutrition. Mm -hmm. So we were able to look at the impacts of different nutrients. We were able to look at foods, we were able to look at food groups. And then the fourth tier is we were able to look at dietary patterns. And I think this is, uh, raises the important point that, you know, it's important to look beyond single nutrients or even beyond single foods because we don't consume nutrients. I don't consume maybe the odd time I, I eat a pack of jelly beans, for example, I might just consume sugar. But, you know, there's very few foods that have only a single nutrient. Mm -hmm. We consume foods that have complex matrices that have, like I said earlier, thousands of different chemicals that interact and more importantly, we consume meals that therefore have lots of different <laughs> foods with their thousands of chemicals, with their different matrix. And as a whole, over a day, a week, a month, we consume a dietary pattern. So we actually looked at all of these four different tiers in our study. So we could see very strong relationships between particular nutrients and particular bugs. We also saw very strong relationships between particular foods uh, and food groups. So we could see particular vegetables or fruits that were associated with particular good bugs. And likewise, you know, particular processed meats or, or you know, particular pies that were associated with some of the bad bugs. And this is all in um, a recent Nature Medicine paper that came out a couple of weeks ago. Um, where we focused in this paper specifically on our microbiome findings. So people that are interested in this can go and have a look at, you know, these individual food level associations that you mentioned. That's great. Well, and I wonder, has, has anyone taken this to the level of, of comparing um, or, or investigating, for example, the Mediterranean diet or, looking into the French paradox, um, these other kind of dietary patterns that we know are associated with lower, lower cardiovascular disease mm -hmm. and, and greater um, lifespan. Um, is that something that's planned for the future or, or have, have you already looked into those different dietary patterns? So we did look at a number of different dietary patterns. Uh, one of them was the Mediterranean diet, and we saw a very strong association between uh, people that adhered strongly to a Mediterranean diet and these good uh, microbes. Mm -hmm. We also looked at different patterns of plant-based and animal-based foods. And I found this particularly interesting. So we looked at an index that separated out healthy plant-based foods from unhealthy plant-based foods. And, you know, you'll be aware, and I'm sure lots of the listeners that there's this, you know, explosion of plant based eating and you know plant-based eating is a healthy way to eat you know being mm -hmm. advocated and what we found which isn't necessarily surprising but this is actually the first study to so clearly uh, show it is a really clear segregation in the microbiome between those that had a lot of the healthy plant-based foods versus those that had a lot of the unhealthy plant-based foods so people that had lots of the healthy plant-based foods had a lot of these good bugs, yet people that had lots of these unhealthy plant-based foods, which are the more processed plant-based foods, had a lot of unhealthy bugs. That's what I was going to ask. When you say unhealthy plant-based foods, are we talking about um, high fructose corn syrup or, which is, I guess, plant-derived, right? So <laughs> <laughs> not quite that bad, but um, I mean, obviously that, that would be part of that, but, you know, white bread, 
um, um, you know, those, those sorts of uh, foods, you know, the kind of refined grains. Refined grains. Mm-hmm. Wow. Wow. Great. Well, this has all been incredibly um, fascinating and just so interesting, I think, also for the, for the listeners. And can you tell us where they can find out more information about um, these studies and, and future predict um, work that you're pursuing? So the, the, the PREDICT-1 studies are currently published in Nature Medicine in two articles, one that came out in June and one that came out uh, a couple of weeks ago in January. And then um, you can follow me on Twitter at Sarah E. E. Berry, um, where I also uh, discuss some of my KCL uh, research at King's College. That's wonderful. Well, thank you so much, Sarah, for coming on the show. This has been great. Pleasure. Thank you for having me. (laughs) You've been listening to Foodie Pharmacology, the science podcast for the food curious. You can find this and all of our other episodes at our website at foodiepharmacology.com or on Apple Podcasts. Thanks so much for listening. Stay healthy out there and I'll see you next time.